Welcome to the 429th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with endurance athlete and ultramarathon runner Dean Carnassus, author of the new book, A Runner's High, My Life in Motion. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Dean Carnassus, New York Times bestselling writer and ultra marathon runner, and the author of the brand new book, Runner's High. Dean, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me run by. Well, if someone hasn't heard yet about your new book, A Runner's High, can you explain why you wrote the book? Yeah, so it's a, it's somewhat of a sequel to my first book. Uh, Runner's High is my fifth book. My first book was called Ultra Marathon Man, and that was somewhat of a coming of age book of me learning about this crazy world of ultra marathoning, which is running foot races of longer than a marathon. And a Runner's High is twenty five years later. <laughs> how am I holding up? <laughs> and what has changed? And how is you know, my relationship with uh, the sport, or the sport and lifestyle of running and ultra marathoning changed, and how has my relationships with my my family and friends changed? So it's somewhat of a reflective book, but it's also a very introspective book. So, how has age impacted your running? You're someone who runs a lot and runs a ton of miles. Do you risk overtraining? I <laughs> I don't I'm I'm not a good person to ask that question because I, I I write about this in the book. I overtrain like crazy and I don't pay attention to convention. But that said, in, in 25 years of, of running ultra marathons, I've never had an injury. You know, the worst that's happened to me is I've lost a couple toenails. So I might be doing something right. If someone listening is a recreational runner who goes out and runs a fun run or a 5K or gets together with a group of friends once or twice a month to run. Do you think it's realistic for someone like that to make the jump to an ultra marathon runner if they had that desire? I really think that anyone can run an ultra marathon. I think it's more mindset than it is physical. And I say that uh, with experience because I've, I've raced and competed in hundreds of ultra marathons across the globe. I've raced and competed in all seven continents. And you see all types of people at the start of an ultra marathon. Some are obviously elite and others are, I'll say, sub-elite. And you, you wonder sometimes how these people are going to get to the finish line, <laughs> but you, they cross the finish line and you realize it's it's not their body that gets them across the finish line, but it's their mental resolve. So if you have the desire and the grit, I think anyone can do it. And so what... How does that grit show up for you when you're 48 miles or, or however many miles into an ultra marathon? How, do, how does that show up for you to keep going? Uh, yeah, and that's exactly what I tried to capture in the book. You go through highs and lows and the highs get higher and the lows get lower. And they also increase in, they decrease in spacing. You might go from feeling like you could run around the world to 20, 20 steps down the trail feel like you can't go another footstep. And an ultra marathon dismantles your body. And it also, it wreaks havoc on your psyche. And you question yourself. There's a lot of self-doubt. And you wonder if this is going to be the race that breaks you. And I think in those moments, we learn a lot about ourselves. I'm 100% Greek. And the Oracle at Delphi said, know thyself. And I think the only way you can know thyself is if you push thyself. And an ultra marathon gives you that form to push thyself. I'm curious, do you have tricks that you think about ahead of time or that you have come back to in terms of when you're at one of those low lows in in an ultra marathon to, to keep going? Is it as just as simple as putting one foot in front of the other and just concentrating on that next step? Yeah, I've, I've tried just about every trick there is. <laughs> yeah. Inevitably, you, you can't fool yourself. And you realize at a point, oh, this is just a trick because this hurts so bad. I'm trying to you know, trick myself out of it. Instead, I, I actively engage in the pain. I, I welcome and encourage the pain. And I explore the pain. And I look at the pain and the hurt and the suffering as a way to experience life more fully. So no longer do I, I try to escape it. Instead, I turn to it. And when the when things get really, then I don't think at all. 
I try to put the blinders on to the future and I don't reflect on the past. I just focus on the here and now, the present moment of time. And I just say to myself, take your next step to the best of your ability. Okay, take your next step to the best of your ability. I don't think about anything else except for the here and now. So given all the miles that you've run and all of the races that you've run, what has been your toughest experience to date? (laughs) <laughs> wow. One time I ran 50 marathons in all of the 50 U.S. states <laughs> in 50 consecutive days. And that was grueling in that not only was I running a marathon every day, but I was getting in a bus and traveling to the next state. So it's not ideal after running a marathon, you know, to sit on your bump, on your rump for eight or 10 hours driving. But that's what I was ending up doing. And the other thing is that it just lasted for so long. I remember, I'll never forget waking up uh, in the morning of mile of marathon number 19 and not even being able to get out of bed. And I thought, I can't even get out of bed today. How am I going to run a marathon? And at that point, I just said, just have the same commitment every morning that you're going to be the best dean that dean can be. You're going to give it your all. If you make it, if you don't, you end up in the hospital, but you're not going to quit until you're completely exhausted. And somehow I made it through 50 marathons. So I'm curious, given the amount that you've run and and the books that you've written, have you spent much time analyzing the appeal of running to yourself in terms of your own personal life, or is it just part of who you are at this point? No, I think a lot about that question. And the the, uh, runner's high is a lot of the book is dedicated to answering that very question. Why do I do it? I talk, we've talked a bit about how I do it. The why is a different question. And I really look back on my life and say, was this the best decision to get into ultra marathoning and to give yourself over to it? And, you know, the, sometimes the answers are unsettling. But I talk, I address that quite deeply in the book. You're an extreme example, obviously, of running and fitness. And unfortunately, as the pandemic is revealed in the U.S., we still have a huge national issue with America struggling with weight and obesity and sedentary lifestyles. I'm curious from your perspective, and and obviously, as we've talked about, I mean, you're someone who runs ultra marathons, but if someone were to be listening to this and they're on the fence and thinking that they would like to just be more active in their life and possibly run a fun run, a 5K, a 10K, or meet a half marathon, what kind of basic words or advice would you offer those people? <laughs> First of all, buy a copy of my book. (laughs) Sometimes just reading about someone else's stories motivates and energizes you. A lot of people have said to me, yeah, I knew I had to do these things. But when I read your books, you made it seem approachable. And I wanted to do these things. They sounded engaging and fun. So, you know, take a a chance on my book and see if that inspires you a bit. And then I say, invest in a good pair of shoes. If you have comfortable running shoes, it just hurts a lot less and you'll be less prone to any sort of injury. And when you first start out, don't run for distance, just run for time. Just try to run three continuous minutes. And I know a lot of experienced runners will say, that's not even a warm up. But for someone who's just starting out, running for three continuous minutes is really tough. And I respect that. Most people will dash out as though they're in a hundred yard dash, and they won't make it three minutes. So, you know, they'll run out of gas at about a a minute and a half. So try to pace yourself to run three continuous minutes. And when you're finished with three minutes, you should be, you know, exhausted. And once you can run three continuous minutes, work, work up to five continuous minutes. And then from five, work up to 10 continuous minutes. And once you can run 10 continuous minutes, try 15 continuous minutes. And at that point, you're ready to try a 5K, which is 3.1 miles. So that's the the way I think someone should ramp up to running. Sure. You just mentioned shoes. What kind of shoes do you prefer or do you wear? I always say to people, listen to everyone, follow no one. <laughs> so I the problem with me is I can run in wooden clogs and it's just fine. But if you have a if you have a very wide forefoot, I would recommend New Balance or a, a brand called Ultra. For the ones who know that a little late is always too late. And that the clock doesn't stop just because you're missing a part. Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry. And our Keep Stock inventory management solutions help ensure you have the right stuff in the right place at exactly the right time. 
Visit Granger.com slash Keepstock to learn more. Granger for the ones who get it done. Northern Kentucky University delivers an innovative, student-centered education that celebrates diversity and encourages all learners to become outstanding leaders in this global society. You belong here at NKU, the university without barriers. Visit nku.edu for more information. If you like a lot of cushioning, there's a brand called Hoka that's a very cushioned shoe. If you have a narrow forefoot, I would say Brooks makes a great shoe or Nike makes some good running shoes as well. Or Asics. There's a lot of really great running shoes out there these days. That's the good news. Great. You mentioned earlier your your challenge and you wrote a book about it where you ran 50 marathons in 50 consecutive days in 50 different states. Are you considering another challenge of that scale? <laughs> it's funny you should ask. I was working on running a marathon in every country of the world in a one-year time span. So there are 198 countries in, in the world. And I was working with the UN and the U.S. Department of State to get passports and permits to get into all these countries. And it was getting pretty close to me being able to start. But obviously, with the pandemic, things have been set back a bit. Right now, my next big adventure is um, going to be running across Australia in August. And how long is that? What's that challenge look like? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's 5,000 kilometers. <laughs> and I used to live in Australia, so I'm familiar with some of the terrain. Australia, when you get away from the, if you look at if you look at the populations of Australia, they're all on the coast. Right. So once you start getting inland, there's just really nothing there except for open expanses. So a lot of it will be running, you know, just an open expanse. Obviously, as we've talked about, you're an ultra marathon runner and you're very plugged into the community of extreme fitness. I'm curious, you have ultra marathons, Spartan races and obstacle races are, are continuing to gain in popularity. CrossFit continues to be popular. Have you given any thought? What do you think next is on the horizon in terms of ultra or intense fitness trends? Yeah, I've done all of those things you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I've done adventure races. I've done a lot of Spartan races. I've done CrossFit contests. And I always come back to running and ultra marathoning. I've also done ultra cycling. Running is just the purest form of human expression. You can't get any simpler than running. So to me, it's the most approachable and the most democratic of, of all sports is running. And it always comes back to running. I certainly enjoy doing some of those other things we discussed. But to me, the running, the most magic is still in running. Uh, I'm curious, given the amount of training that you do and the number of miles that you run, what do you eat to fuel your fitness? Do you follow a specific uh, diet or? It's funny you should ask. I'll never live down the story from my first book. Of I was on a 200-mile, 12-person relay, but I don't have 11 friends, so I was a team of one. <laughs> so I was out there running 200 miles, and in the middle of the night, I, I was out in a backcountry road. I didn't have anyone, no crew around. I'd run out of food, but I had a cell phone and a credit card. So I ordered a pizza <laughs> and I told him, I said, don't slice it and make it with a really thin crust. And when they delivered it to me, I took it out of the box and rolled it into this big Italian log, like this big burrito. And um, I ate as I ran. It was so messy. It got all over me, but it was so good. <laughs> so I'll never live down that story. And people say, how did you eat an entire pizza while you were running? You've got to remember, I was running for 45 hours. So it's, it's not like I was just sprinting down the block. I was out there for a long time. But since then, I've gone to more natural foods. I, I like to use um, nut butters for energy. So hazelnut butter, cashew nut butter are two of my favorite. I still eat you know peanut butter once in a while and almond butter. But I find that nut butters are a great source of energy. And I also, I work with a company called Hammer Nutrition, and they make some scientifically engineered uh, products specifically for ultra marathoning. That's great. Where can people find you online to learn more about you, your running, and your books? Yes, I'm, I'm visible. <laughs> uh, someone told me, if you Google Dean, I'm the first Dean that comes up. <laughs> so you can just Google Dean. My last name is Karnas. It's you know, K-A-R-N-A-Z-E-S. I've got a website. I'm on social media. 
And that's if you want to learn more about me, that's probably the best way to do it. That's great. Again, we've been speaking with Dean Carnassus, New York Times bestselling writer, ultra marathon runner, and the author of the brand new book, A Runner's High, My Life in Motion. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Dean, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks for having me run by. Thanks. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of A Runner's High, My Life in Motion by Dean Carnassus, read by Andrew Iden and published by Harper Audio, available wherever audiobooks are sold. I'm lying catawampus splayed ass to the dirt in the trail, one leg tweaked improbably beneath me, staring up at the afternoon sky, seeing sparkles of light flickering before me like circling fireflies, and wondering what the hell just happened. A sharp ringing in my ears perforates the otherwise complete stillness. A lazy film of dust rising indolently around my idle carcass. Inside the motor room, my muscles and bodily organs register a dull tenderness. But it is the nausea that is most pronounced. A queasy sensation of being punched hard in the gut. What just happened? Moments ago, I was in perfect harmonic flow. Bounding along, nicely, cool and in control, step, spring, step. Then everything changed. I vaguely recall flight, weightless soaring, a defiant middle finger to gravity as time briefly suspended. My wings spread, fly, be free. Until impact, kaboom. Everything just exploded, like a skydiver whose chute failed to deploy. Now I'm heaped on the soil like Icarus, a lifeless, charred exoskeleton, smoldering in ruin and wondering what just went down. A ticker tape of questions scroll across the screen of my mind. Is anything broken? Will someone find me? Where am I? To answer that final question, we need to dial back the clock to yesterday morning, a time when I had a sinking premonition. I shouldn't be doing this. I really shouldn't be doing this. I know better. Then I shut the door behind me. I was doing it. At least the timing of my departure seemed good. The merciless Bay Area traffic was showing its gentler side, and I slipped through the busiest corridors with barely a tap on the brakes. Sometimes it takes hours just getting across town. And when it comes to sucking the living soul out of a creature, perhaps no human creation is more noxious than traffic, with the exception of TSA lines. Still, despite the absence of congestion, it took nearly eight hours to reach my destination, the juxtaposed pastoral hamlet of Bishop, California. Nestled under the striking peaks of the eastern Sierra Nevada mountain range, Bishop is something of a conundrum. It's in a beautiful natural setting, though one oddly frequented equally by hikers and bikers, and the bikes they're riding aren't the kind with pedals. The main street through town has quaint galleries, outdoor mountaineering stores, a nature center, and an indie bookstore, things you might expect in a mountain settlement. But then there are rows of fast food joints, seedy bars, a collection of budget hotels, and a Kmart all of which thoroughly taper the city's charm with a liberal dousing of contemptible. I was meeting my father here, at one such establishment of lesser repute. Unfortunately, there was little choice in the matter. It was the only remaining hotel room in town. Reservations were made last minute, and I booked what I could get. As would be expected on such short notice, there also weren't many options for securing a crew to help support my endeavor though I somehow snagged the very best, i.e. dear old dad. Who else would drop everything on a single two-minute phone call and drive six hours from Southern California to meet me? There hasn't been a more loyal companion in my life than my father. A spry 82 years old, the man bounced about like a loosely attached valence electron, careening haphazardly around its outer shell. Sparks flew off him, a perpetual fission reaction capable of erupting with no forewarning. He was electric, charismatic, overwhelming at times, and wholly uncontainable. Every moment with him was slightly unpredictable. The older he grew, the more lively his personality became. Laughter, angst, melancholy, joy, 
All of these emotions could be expressed within the confines of a single brief interaction. You never knew what to expect with Dad. If you have a family relying on your income, you need life insurance. But finding the best quote shouldn't take a lifetime. That's where Policy Genius comes in. In minutes, Policy Genius could save you 50% or more simply by comparing quotes from America's top insurers. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team handles all the paperwork and red tape. To save on life insurance and get protection for you and your family, head to policygenius.com today.